So we recently passed the 50th anniversary for the moon landing, but if you're a 90s kid or a millennial, someone who had a childhood mainly in the 90s, you undoubtedly were inundated with constant news about the Hubble Space Telescope. And um, amazingly, it's it's a piece of technology that since the early 90s, I believe, we're going we're gonna to find that out, has been in commission. And uh, it's been shedding, it's been able to pierce um, deeper and further into the cosmos than we ever have yet. Um, other than the, um, at least in the visible wavelengths, I believe. Of course, being humans, seeing in the visible spectrum, or the visible range, I guess, of the EM spectrum, it's is most impactful for us. So let's let's look at the. Um, I guess we'll section it off. This will be kind of a companion piece for my uh, my upcoming video about star birth so let's look at we're gonna look at nebula today nebula the diffuse um, multiple tens sometimes hundreds of light year wide cloud structures in the Milky Way that are both the homes, um, are, are the, the, the structures within which the stars are born and die in a continual cycle. And uh, it really sheds light on the universe as well as being incredibly beautiful to look at. And like Richard Feynman said when he was discussing um, the merits of science versus art in the you know, the intuitions that go along with each. Um, when he picked a flower up off a lunch table they were at and looked at it and said, the fact that I know that photosynthesis is happening and, you know, uh, like I used in my last video, the, the green leaves that I see coming off this stem are absorbing all the wavelengths of the invisible portion of the spectrum except for the uh, the ones that correspond to the color green, which is why we see it as green, because it reflects off. It's the only color that bounces back off the leaf and isn't absorbed by it. Um, the fact that I know all these details about a flower does not take away from the beauty, and in fact it might even add to the beauty that I experience when looking at it. So we're gonna look through this book and hopefully get a little more uh, knowledge, but also a lot more um, visual detail about the universe and, and in particular our galaxy that uh, surrounds us, because we are made of star stuff. We are the children of the cosmos. We really are. And to me that's, that's amazing to really think about, um, which is why we got our buddy Carl Sagan here, in spirit, even, I guess, because he's off, <laughs> he's off camera. So, uh, yeah, let's find out more about our local island universe that we live in, in the molecular clouds out of which stars and the material that we're made of came out of. And um, shout out to my local library, by the way, for having amazing books like this. So it opens with really, uh, it's probably one of the most beautiful pictures here. Um, it's a diffuse nebula. This is a, looks like a, um, that famous ant-like structure looks like a uh, supernova remnant, maybe. And here at much, much deeper scales, more distant scales, we have, it's kind of like a, a galaxy merger 
These are extra galactic structures outside our own galaxy. So, oh, here we go. And up here it says, so the first one is a colorful cauldron of creation. These swirling clouds of gas and dust in the Tarantula Nebula are vast stellar nurseries. So they continually collapse and spawn new stars by the thousands. So this one is, um, this one's actually a nebula that exists in the satellite galaxy to us, one of the largest. That's actually a cluster of millions of stars that's orbiting our galaxy that somehow has managed to retain its own gravitational tie between its individual stars and not been ripped apart by the Milky Way's central force. And then we have the planetary nebula Menzel 3 is well named as the Ant Nebula. No one knows why the central star ejects matter into such a strange pattern. Could be a magnetic effect. But there may be maybe even two stars at work here. And of course this book is from like the early 2000s, so some of the pictures are a little pixelated, but they're still, uh, you get, you know, we can get the gist. These are two, and the last one, two spiral galaxies pass each other like cosmic ships in the night. Strong gravitational forces from the large one, NGC 2207, and um, on the left, have caused stars to be flung out of the smaller one, IC 2163, in streamers stretching a hundred thousand light years. That's... So I've been working on um, a more proper, detailed, a little bit inspired in script. Uh, I say inspired because I ended up writing a little intro um, just off the cuff, and then I I wanted to set the tone of the video to be, um, you know, one, like all my videos, especially with space. Um, these are topics I'm particularly, specifically interested in uh, for my own purposes, you know, just my own passion. And I wanted to try to create a sense of awe, you know, a sense of wonder and... Um, you know, I was, I'm going to dive into the science um, of the actual astronomy of how we know what type of matter is in the stars and, you know, how we can visually detect the movement and the parallax of stars so we know distance and then we can tell the um, different absorption lines of the spectra emitted from the stars to tell us the mass and temperature and we can group them and you know I wanted to get into the details of that but science can often be really cold and, and you know rigidly logical and, and ruthlessly rational and sometimes that takes some of the the human element the, the you know the awe and intrigue and, and inspiration you know and the passion out of it when you're just barraged with a list of facts and so I wanted to put it in the proper context of like this picture here with these galaxies it's so it's so amazing that um, you know we used to think that we were the center of the universe then it went to okay we're we're not the center but our sun that we orbit 
is the center. And then we're like, okay, well, maybe our sun is one of, you know, millions of stars that are in orbit around the uh, the universe. The thing we, we call our galaxy now is what we used to call the whole universe. We didn't think there were much, there was much more than, a, you know, a few tens of thousands of light years uh, of, of worth of material distant from us. And then we discovered that we can detect red shifts and these particularly uh, varying type of stars tell us based on you know deduction of gathering evidence and um, making a bunch of logical correlations we're able to tell that we saw these stars up close and we could actually measure their distances and then we with more and more powerful telescopes in the early 1900s were able to eventually see some of these nebula that we're about to look at in our um, in our own galaxy were really tiny but still diffuse too diffuse to be a star and we found out that they ended up not even being nebula so we do have big light years across gaseous clouds in our own galaxy but it turns out some of the smaller ones ended up being millions of light years away from us and completely outside our galaxy and they weren't nebula but they were actually island uh, universes of their own and it's so amazing and um the largest of which, which is about the, on a really clear night, you'd be able to see it. It's about as wide, visibly at least, um, as about six moons stacked up next to each other. That's the Andromeda Nebula. It's the largest galaxy close to us that's of comparable size. And, um, And then once we discovered that, that opened up a whole, literally a whole universe, a door to a, a scale of distance that we, we weren't ready to comprehend, really. And so, you know, this has all happened over the course of, you know, maybe a few thousand years if you really, really go back. But um, astronomy itself, proper in the scientific form has only been around for maybe 500 years since Galileo first was able to de de uh, detect the dots around Jupiter that were not orbiting or transversing the sky like the other stars or even the, the planets how they kind of followed the stars but these dots with his telescope he was able to determine that they were objects orbiting around the point of light in the sky we call Jupiter. So that was the initial foot in the door. And then Hubble, the namesake of, you know, whose namesake this book is about. And uh, it's full of pictures from, was, was the guy who, along with many other scientists and conceptions that that he built his theories on top of, Hubble was able to determine that the universe is not only hundreds of millions, if not billions, you know, thousands of millions of light years across. Um, he was also able to de determine that we are living in a universe filled with, we're living in a galaxy inside a universe filled with billions of other galaxies between which the space you know of millions of light years that exists is somehow intrinsically expanding so if we were to take the space and slice it up into a million little pieces and look at each one of those pieces individually those pieces themselves are expanding it's just so beautiful so it's um 
learning about interesting things like that you know universe is expanding we don't even know into what we don't even know what that means we don't know the nature of things like dark matter and we don't know how to synthesize our understanding of the subatomic world with these massive objects that are unfathomably large but still yet composed of these subatomic particles and the, you know that make atoms which coalesce in the stars and fuse together to create bursts of energy from the tiny bits of matter that are lost in the interactions that drive these galactic scale dynamics that we are studying and so the universe is just one big playground it's one big science experiment and we're part of it and somehow in some meta concept we're also observers of the universe out of which we emerged so i think hubble i think that's the uh, the right way to look at these photographs so with that said let's look and uh hopefully enjoy on a deeper level some of these photographs have been some of the most stunning pictures taken <laughs> this one's named a spirograph the spirograph nebula for its intricately woven structure and it's actually just kind of pixelated so that's why it doesn't doesn't really look too clear but they said it defies explanation so it's uh it's just amazing to think about that like then we're able to witness these things probably like cavemen looking at cell phones and you know not knowing what what really is behind them i mean we have so much more idea than they would but i guess that's a bad analogy um man we're just so fortunate to be around to even observe this stuff i think circling silently circling silently in space a few hundred miles above our heads it's one of the most amazing scientific instruments ever made it's the Hubble Space Telescope. It's actually got a rocky start and a pretty disastrous debut. Even though the the mirror was uh, it was distorted, it was distorted in returning blurry images. So um, I'm sure it was billions of dollars were, if not hundreds of millions of dollars were spent on this this program developing this telescope and sending it into orbit um, but the imperfection in it was only two fiftieths of the width of a human hair but that was enough to distort and blur images that are of course these are from you know billions of years uh, light years away and in our local galaxy at least hundreds of uh you know hundreds to thousands tens of thousands of light years so luckily i guess it was imperfect imperfect in a certain way that <laughs> allowed for a their phrase was kind of tongue-tying but they said it was where is it let's see it's uh the very perfection of the imperfection of the primary mirror <laughs> made it relatively easy, optically speaking, to correct. So in 1993, spacewalking astronauts, they recovered the telescope, they rendezvoused with it in orbit, which is a feat in and of itself. And they were able to put a corrective 
lens on it. And, and since then, it's been, you know, almost 30 years since then. We've uh, gone up and returned and, you know, added new uh, corrections to make it see even better and do even more. It's pretty amazing. And the reason, in, in to put it in the perspective, again, it's all about perspective, I guess. This thing, um, when you look at it, where is it? Right here. Yeah, when you look at this thing, I always um, got the idea that it was only about 10, you know, 10 feet or so long. I, I thought it could fit in a room, but this whole structure is actually the size of a, of a school bus. So it's, um, it's got a pretty big aperture, huge lens through which light can come through, but it's nowhere near as big as some of the Earth-based, ground-based telescopes. Um, both, I'm sure, because it's really heavy and costly to lift payloads up into orbit, but also because it doesn't necessarily need to have um, a huge lens to see more than any ground-based telescopes are able to. And that's because our atmosphere creates a window. They call it a, a dirty window. And, um, yeah, that was just my note about chaos. And so we actually have to see through clouds uh, of interstellar gas floating between the stars. And unless they're lit up by local starlight, we actually don't know how much than there is out there, because the only way we can actually detect them is in just like 99%, I'm sure, of astronomy. It's all visual. Um, it's about detecting electromagnetic radiation. Um, and of course, Hubble is uh, primarily geared towards the visible spectrum, end of the spectrum. But we have other wavelengths as well. And radio waves, for instance, are long enough. So if you have a particle maybe this big, they're long enough to go around them. And gamma being the highest frequency, the highest rate of cycling up and down, cycling through periods, the shortest wavelength but also the most energetic. The particles in space can be atomic size, or they can be molecules and, and bits of actual dust, which are larger. And depending on how big they are, if they're smaller than the wavelength, then the wavelength, like radio waves and, and infrared rays, and a lot of times, can pass around them. But as the particles get bigger and bigger, the radio waves or the um, the light waves bounce, and, and they they're not long enough to be able to go all the way around them, and for their information to be transferred through them. So, if they're shorter than the length of this penny, this quarter, then they're going to get absorbed by the quarter much more frequently than longer wavelengths. So I guess that's all to say that, um, to say that m material in between the stars and the, um, of course, the atmosphere being much, much thicker and denser, all diffract and obscure the light from stars to make it different and not a pristine image of its emitting source, you know, so Hubble avoids the atmosphere and the really, really dense, thick oxygen, nitrogen atoms in our atmosphere and has a crystal clear eye on the cosmos.
cosmos and that's what's amazing about it so it already is way ahead of the game it's the size of a school bus it weighs as much as two bull elephants and it can be turned to laser sharp precision precision and stay focused on one area of space even as it orbits the earth with tiny thrusters so um, it's really just an amazing piece of technology um, I wrote here some uh, something to kind of put in perspective the scale I think that's one thing also that I enjoy is that the scale of these objects are so much more meaningful when you understand the scale of you know things closer to us I guess like our solar system even that itself is immense and yet it only takes about five hours to hit Pluto and maybe you know most as you can imagine most um uh, coalesced matter more massive matter would be closer closest rather to the center of a gravitational source like our sun and so the furthest extent of our sun's dominion the, the point at which the sun's gravity becomes so insignificant as to kind of not even count anymore and maybe other stars start to be more gravitationally dominant it would take so Pluto takes about five hours at the speed of light five light hours it would take months it would take about three two to three months of traveling at the speed of light away from our Sun before our Sun's gravity becomes insignificant and Although months seems like, you know, I think from the distance to the moon, I had a, uh, I have a globe. Hold on one second. Why do I say that? And this thing is I'd say about 14 inches across probably says it somewhere but the distance to the moon is about this is uh, supposed to represent 7900 miles or 8000 miles across in diameter that's our whole earth which um, in cosmic scales is really really insignificant the distance from Earth to the Moon, the true enormity of distance between everything in space, starting with our planets and our neighborhood. You know, distance to the Sun to the Sun is 93 million miles. Distance to the Moon is just 200,000 miles, roughly rough numbers. The diameter of Earth here is 8,000 miles. So you know, again, round numbers. That's like 20 25 times the diameter of this earth that means if i'm in this room here say you know round numbers if we say this is a you know a foot foot and a half this room is maybe 12 13 feet long so that's only roughly about 10 times um the diameter so I'd have to go all the way to the end of this room and then another uh, twice that basically to be the distance away from the earth that the moon is and I don't know if you can see it maybe we can show me walking away so here's our earth right here And I 
spent all that time showing you that because well for you know for one Hubble is about a thousand times closer so since we have this Hubble would literally be like boop like that close boop anyways it's it's really just on the surface really it's just a couple hundred miles up yet it takes light only two seconds to get two room lengths away from Earth. It takes eight minutes to get 93 million miles from the Earth to the Sun, five hours of light speed to go just to Pluto. And then a couple months, which, uh, that only gets us out to the furthest stretches of our solar system and then from there he has to travel for another uh, 40 months or so before you hit the nearest star four years going at the speed of light so these um, distances are so vast it's it's you know and that's just the nearest star four years it's gonna take another 20 Multiply that by about 5,000, so 5,000 sets of four years, and then maybe you'll get to Sagittarius A, the center of our galaxy around there. I heard the other day, and I think this was in regards to someone saying how unfair it was that billionaires have so much money, but they're relating the concept, the distinction between a million versus a billion of something. And when they did time, I think it was seconds. Yeah, yeah, that's what I have here. If you do a million seconds, that's only about, well, I mean, it's a lot, but it's only about 11 and a half days. That's a million seconds. A billion seconds isn't just 11 days. No, it's a thousand times that. It's 32 years, 32 years. So that brings us back to 1987. That's luckily a bit older than I am so the distinction when you hear you know uh, Andromeda is two million miles away oh. <laughs> two million that would be uh, that'd be like a 45th of the way to the Sun two million light years away and then you hear something being two billion light years away another you know whole uh, set of galaxies galaxy cluster the, that's the distance between 11 days ago and 30 years ago so you know the universe is immense and this and that but you can't get an accurate depiction when you use the word immense for 200,000 miles to the Sun or to the moon and two billion light years to you know another galaxy you can't accurately appreciate those distances those distances distances are so so vastly different that it you know it, that's where science comes in and having an understanding of you know putting things in terms of human scales I think really helps um appreciate the things that we're finding out about in the universe so we have our solar system um, we have our Sun which is really everything that we um, sorry for the squeaky pages that we base our observations of other stars on and Um, these nebulas are the nurseries of star birth to where in a very crude overview what happens is that stars explode and the impulse of these incredibly energetic explosions they send shock waves and we have different areas of the galaxy that have these huge very very roughly singular structures 
you know, they're, they're very loosely tied together, but you have areas that we can distinguish as separate clouds, molecular clouds, light years ac across. Um, we're, I think we're currently actually on the edge of one, um, as far as we know as well. And you can imagine when you're looking at something spinning across something as large, 100,000 light years across, you're going to have varying velocities. And even a small tangential, uh, a small radial velocity difference. I, how should I do this? Like, so they're both, you know, orbiting around, but maybe the one inside's orbiting a little bit closer. And even that small difference could be hundreds of thousands of kilometers a second, or or at least meters a second difference. And that's enough to where the edges of those cloud structures, especially when they're catalyzed by huge impulses of energy like supernova, um, they could c collapse and create a kind of wave front. And out of these these wave fronts, the, um, the initial collapse or rotation that will lead to the eventual collapse of stars is, is created and that emerges. So, although space, and we could see here the, uh, there we go, and we could see here the, what do we have? Stellar nursery of the Trifid Nebula, dramatically lit and intense by intense radiation. of a nearby massive star. Over time, the radiation will eat away the cloud and expose many stars that have managed to form within it. So we see here, let me try to get the whole book in view. Um, but yeah, we have traditional conventional means of heat and just like when you turn your stove on if it's an electric one you can see the burner go from black when it's completely room temperature to slowly dimly red and when it gets bright hot maybe it's orange like a glowing neon orange and that's the same way with these stars they actually these nebula right here they form these zones, and that's what makes the spiral arms of our galaxy, is that there's actually these zones of star formation. We can see here, this is the, uh, the Cone Nebula. It's a huge pillar of gas and dust. It's lit up by ultraviolet radiation from young hot stars from behind. It's one of the first images taken April 2002. Yeah, this is amazing. So all this darkness here, I believe, is light obscured by the, um, you know, molecules and uh, the nebula of gas between us and the stars behind it. And um, here's the Horsehead Nebula. All, again, obscuring the light behind it, creating a silhouette that looks a lot like a horse head and a, a long flowing mane. But you have these these massive, and then this is, these areas um, and the spiral arms, and it's a lot like, I guess it's a lot like the, uh, the waves of a traffic jam, where one person breaking creates a ripple effect, and even though the individual cars end up moving on, you know, you go and this person breaks, and this one goes, and this person breaks, and even though you end up moving on individually, the effect, the phenomena of cars 
um, getting closer to one another and then moving off, that effect, the bottleneck effect, still somehow exists. And it's kind of an emergent phenomena. And there are periods or areas of our galaxy that that uh, that create the spiral arms that we can see that we think our galaxy is uh, is made of. Of course, we're in it, so we can't get a bird's eye view, but we can look at plenty of other spiral and bar galaxies, and we think that they're pretty similar to the ones that we're in, the one that we're in. So this is the the Eta Carina Nebula. This is the keyhole. Curving filaments of glowing gas and a lacework of silhouetted cold dark clouds make up the keyhole nebula. It's pretty beautiful. Although that definitely looks like someone's flipping them off. Flipping them off through the keyhole. So it's, um, and then here we have the Orion Nebula, which is one of the closest large nebula. And, and, and I think in some very gen general way, we're actually a part of the Orion Nebula, or at least we're right up next to it. Because the nebula itself is what you could see right here. Um, and that's what you would see if you look through a very nice telescope. You would see a very, um, much more blurry and diffuse and small version of that if you look through some binoculars, maybe. But the... Yeah, the traffic jam that is the arms of our galaxy is where most of the star formation tends to take place, and uh, we'll go into that further into detail in the Starbirth episode coming up. So the Orion Nebula is perhaps the most, perhaps the finest constellation of all the heavens, spanning the celestial equator, which for us is, I guess, it's the part of the sky that is directly overhead for us when we're, you know, at midnight, directly opposing the sun, facing away from from the sun. Um, the the line that transits perfectly overhead from east to west. It's visible to stargazers anywhere in the world, and it's really the only nebula or constellation, rather, that I know. Orion is one of the few constellations that bears more than a passing resemblance to its actual, um, to the namesake. You know, it looks, it's got, it's a rectangle-ish, but it has, you know, two shoulders, two feet, and three stars going across where it's its belt, and then it has some stars going down that look, like that are most likely its sword, or some other phallic symbol. The individual stars, individual stars that make up Orion are spectacular. The bright orange supergiant star, Betelgeuse, that we all know. So Betelgeuse, and I won't say it a third time, marks his right shoulder. So on the night sky, it's going to be the top right, right here. While the brilliant white Rigel marks the left knee. Defining Orion's belt are three slightly less bright stars. Hanging from the belt is his sword, also called the handle. And so the 
truly nebulous, incredible beauty. So it's only 1600 light years away. Um, you know, which is one and a half thousand times or, you know, 400 times the distance to the nearest star, Proxima Centauri, but it's still really, really close for us, for such a large structure. Um, it's called M42 because this guy Messier was the, I think in the late 1700s, he was one of the first astronomers to properly catalog all the major um, celestial objects. And so Andromeda is M, oh man, M31, I think. Um, the one that, uh, the galaxy that we just got a picture of the black hole of, um, whose black hole we just got a picture of is M87, Messier 87. Yeah, Orion Nebula is M42. So the star in question is Theta Orionis. Um, it's a multiple star system actually, known as the trapezium, because it's like a trapezoid. It's an arrangement of four stars, only about 300,000 years old. So these are fresh off the press. These stars have just, in, in galactic cosmic time scales, these stars have just started igniting, um, having enough mass to and been around long enough to have a core that is gravitationally under such pressure that the hydrogen mainly hydrogen that's always the the first um, the first atoms to bind n n nucleically I guess through nuclear fusion and then it takes much more pressure almost exponentially more rather don't hold me to that though it takes a lot more pressure though to start binding heavier atoms even the next one up helium so you know these stars are uh, i think in some of these stellar clouds and it might even be in the orion nebula they've been able to detect with infrared um, proto stars that haven't quite hit nuclear fusion yet um, because it's pretty rare cosmically again most you know if we were just probabilistically just going to be thrown into the universe at some random point in time you would imagine that most of the objects you see are going to be the objects that have endured for the longest spans of time all the things that come and go, or at least the phases of stars that come and go real quick, those things are going to be relatively, relatively rare because of the sheer age of the universe. It's 14 billion years old. And remember the million distinction between a million and billion. So something even a million years old is ridiculously fast and rapid compared to a billion billions of years not even you know let alone 300,000 years so um, it's really amazing that we're so close to this nebula and we can witness this phase of star birth and Hubble has been great in representing this to us so Oh yeah, where I was getting at with that is that before fusion even takes place in this small time span, there's enough, it's almost like a hot Jupiter. If Jupiter were, I think, 10 times more massive, it would just have enough mass to collapse the core into um, a fusion-making reactor, you know, to press um, ionized or, or plasma hydrogen together. Um, so close that the, I think, uh, one out of every 10 to the 22nd reactions, which is a lot, 
would would create fusion would um, overcome the strong force I believe between protons and bind the protons together releasing a little bit of uh, particle in terms of a uh, in the form of a positive positron I believe and that little bit of energy which is uh, minuscule in terms of the mass it would follow Einstein's equals mc squared which is the energy created from that mass is going to be the mass multiplied by the speed of light squared squared which is enormous enormous so even before it hits that there's still enough um, without fusion there's still enough convectional and um, I always forget the words there's convection there's radiation convection is the flow of thermal activity radiation is light pressure and heat emitted by light and conduction conduction that's what it is so there'd be enough thermal activity in those three forms to um, to create a glowing proto star that hasn't quite hit fusion yet, um, but it will still emit some light if we're close enough to see it at least. In the um, particularly like our bodies emit light in the infrared spectrum, not visibly, of course that would be bad. Um, we can see like infrared goggles. We can see many stars that aren't visible in the human um, range of, of sight, but we see them um, just about to light up. And especially in these nurseries, we see that. So there are two, um, let's see what it says here. What does it say? Actually, it's multiple star system. So only 300,000 years old, these stars are in their infancy and they're pumping out vast amounts of energy in the ultraviolet range of the spectrum. So this isn't the only region in Orion where star formation is taking place. The whole constellation is embedded in a vast billowing cloud of gas and dust. So there are two particularly dense areas, known as the southern and northern molecular clouds. M42 is part of the southern cloud, which nearly merges into the northern cloud around Zeta Orionis, the most southerly star in Orion's belt. The outstanding feature of the northern cloud is the horse head, the horse head nebula. Okay. So the Horsehead Nebula is the one we just saw. Right there. And... Yeah, okay. And so, in this structure of uh, this, this part of Orion right here, what we're seeing is, what we're seeing are a lot of polyps out there. They're calling them polyps, which are these little concentrated balls of dense molecular dust and material that are, you know, ultimately going to form stars. And it's a mosaic of 15 separate images spanning a region of about two and a half light years across. Among the features seen in this turbulent factory are the polyps. Up here, here, and here, here. About 150 of them. 
their solar systems in the embryo. Very cool. And then, um, I guess similar, we have down here, similar to, uh, similar, I guess in light maybe, maybe a little brighter. These are uh, brown dwarfs down here. We have the four main, very bright stars in the trapezium cluster, but all uh, at least many of these around them are called brown dwarfs, which are stars that I think either didn't hit nuclear fusion or were just true stardom. Yeah. Yeah, so they're way too big to be planets, but they, um, they didn't hit true nuclear fusion. So... They do glow, but I think by conventional means only, or they just don't have enough mass to, to glow really brightly at all, if they are hitting uh, nuclear fusion. So and then here we have, God, this, this is uh, really beautiful right here. I think this is called the waterfall, if I remember right. The enigmatic waterfall, both polar jets from a protostar can be seen slamming into an interstellar gas using the very large telescope image. Yeah, very creative names for these telescopes. Um, this is a, a ground based telescope, I guess, seeing this one, so not helpful. The nature of the prominent waterfall is a mystery. So we have a, a stream, a stream of, of yellow, yellow green, you know, dust that's being condensed. Probably, you know, maybe some other stars billowing radiation out this way. Um, but this one certainly right here, we can see two wave fronts right here. And it's jetting out, and particularly with this one, it almost looks like the jet from the M87 cluster. And that's that's really beautiful. That's amazing. It's really astonishing just the amount of energy that would take, you know. And thank God we haven't been hit by any supernovas yet. In Thank God our sun is a pretty tame star by galactic universal standards. So and then over here we have, uh, let's see what it says. It's cool. The um, another, you know, titillating, if I can say that, titillatingly terrifying, or I would just say meaningfully interesting uh, perspective to take is, you know, we we get raptured by these myths about titans and and ancient gods being, you know, and then the uh, in the Vedic tradition, they have these, I don't know, are they Brahmins that are, you know, billions and billions of years old? And that's what these galactic celestial objects are. You know, they're, it says here, some of these clouds, they not only stretch hundreds of light years across, but they can be quiet for millions of years, and then they get impacted by they get brushed by another cloud coming by or they 
you know, a supernova explodes and expands and emits and propels particles and radiation and energy enough to compress waves as it goes through um, these clouds that other than that for hundreds of millions of years were very, you know, slumbering, they were inactive, they were very stagnant and still. And then a nice trigger takes place, catalyzes a, uh, you know, an impulse of energy gets absorbed by it, and then maybe somehow just enough gravity is just dense enough to be a little bit denser than other areas of the clouds. And in an interesting, you know, mathematical probabilistic thing, which um, is like a feedback loop where you know, really what supermassive black holes um, in a way can be characterized as are these huge concentrations of, of matter and gravity. And the more you have matter concentrated in one particular area, the more likely it is to have more matter be gravitationally attracted to it. And therefore the less matter remains in these giant molecular clouds for other stars to be anywhere near as massive as just the first few big, you know, clumps of um, concentrations, rather, of matter that will form some of the biggest but shortest lived stars because the more massive a star is, and we know this, they've they've observed stars being as massive supergiants as they possibly can, and they recognize that there is a limit, there is an upper threshold, of course, past which a black hole is probably going to occur, but beyond which stars are way too unstable, way too gravitationally pressurized to be able to um, even be held in balance by the outward pressure exerted by nuclear fusion reactions. And so these stars, um, I believe they, they end up just collapsing on themselves and they die extravagant supernovistic deaths, deaths. And in the very, very tiny, tiny time span of their lives and then a much more um, rapid, almost, yeah, even human time scales of their deaths, the actual explosion, they actually create all the heavy elements heavier than iron, which I think has 25 or 26 protons, or maybe it's 27. So all the elements with protons, all elements are defined by how many protons they have, so there are no two element, two different elements that have the same number of protons. That, that is what defines which element they are. So, hydrogen has one, helium has two, oxygen has eight. And these, all these heavier elements with more than 25-ish protons, they're all formed in these very large, short-lived, rapidly dying, expiring stars so much pressure created when the core is not able to withstand the outward pressure of, you know, things that make our star look like, you know, our moon next to Jupiter, or maybe even something smaller than that, maybe, you know, maybe a, a continent next to Jupiter, and these pressures overwhelm the core, and just, bah, they collapse it. And they, uh, and they create these superheated fusion reactions that are gonna take iron and fuse it together with iron and, and this, you know, complex series of interactions, domino-like effect, this, I think they call it a cataclysmic runaway chain reaction, so, so. I just made that up, but it, I think I used some of the keywords right. Um, 
yeah, it's just amazing to, you know, we had, you know, some things in our, in our blood, or at least, I guess we have iron in our blood, but that's created by regular stars. Anything on Earth, you know, um, gold and silver and all these heavier elements are all created in these supernova booms, so, um, yeah, it's just amazing. I, I'm so, I'm just amazed by this. So, I'm calling Baklav, yeah. Alright, so, we have dark clouds float serenely against the backdrop of light. Down here, And, uh, from a loose cluster of young, sorry, that's my dad talking to his buddy from Canada. For some reason, they love hopping on speakerphone and yelling like they're, uh, like they're at a baseball game sitting 10 seats apart. Um, anyways, down here we have dark clouds float serenely against the backdrop of young of a loose cluster of young massive stars in a stellar nursery known as 2944 I see 2944 these dust clouds are named Thackeray's globules for the astronomer Thackeray who first spied them in 1950 so up here we have um, some colorful jets at the center of this image is Aish, is the Hubble image of the Herbig Hero object 32, the HH32. It's, it's a young star blasting jets of matter onto space in polar jets into space. One jet at the top we can see plowing into interstellar gas, making it glow in the light of hydrogen atoms, which are uh, roughly green in spectrum so I guess that's something I didn't mention yet is different atoms um, they're different sizes and so they get excited in different ways and every time they get excited by energy or light you know in the form of energy hitting it energy in the form of light rather they their electrons jump up a certain specific wavelength um, or a certain energy level, rather, to an excited state. And when that excited state settles down, as energy tends to, you know, entropy in, in the universe tends to make energy um, um, dissipate, you know, and things like to always take the path of least resistance, and things tend to like to be in the most low energy state, um, as they can, when they can, like all of us, the same. <laughs> they, uh, they, they re-emit some of the light, or at least they re-emit energy that creates light that corresponds, that, that's wavelength, corresponds to that energy level. So, um, in a way, it's not the exact same light or anything, but in a way it's like they absorb it, and temporarily get a little bigger in this excited state and then their electrons after a while jump back down to a a lower energy state and that jumping down releases potential energy or uh, quantum energy in the form of protons f sorry f photons um, at that specific wavelength so hydrogen gets excited and absorbs a certain energy and then it releases when it gets uh, closer to a lower energy level it releases uh, light in the form of green a green wavelength and we could see that through spectroscopy looking at light through a prism and we see these absorption lines that tell us that so um, 
in the sulfur ion, sulfur, another atom, creates a blue hue. The jet streaming in the opposite direction is mostly obscured by dust, but we can see a little, a little excerpt of it right down there. And this one over here is actually pretty interesting looking. It's a bubble, a cocoon of gas and dust surrounds a small cluster of young hot stars in the large Magellanic cloud. And they lie inside a certain nebula, one of many star forming regions in the galaxy. It's amazing. And then now they're talking about so we were kind of seeing, we started off looking at diffuse nebula, and then we went into nebula that have just been, um, you know, initialized into collapsing and forming new stars. And now they're talking about nebula that have created new stars, and the stars are undergoing this dynamic process they call the the word that's for a specific type of star I thought it was right here at least what is it the T that's it uh, the T Tari phase capital letter T space Tari T A U R I after the first star of its kind that was discovered and in this phase they think is a you know, it's like an adolescent phase. It's a trans, um, it's a uh, transition period, I guess, if you will. It's where the star is trying to find it's 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 varying in size and, and pressure because it's trying to find its equilibrium at which you know stars like our sun have finally been able to settle down and find a perfect balance between internal emission of nuclear radiation, perfectly balancing the outward, you know, seemingly external or inward, I guess, force of gravity pulling in, pulling uh, matter in on top of it. And so we have, you know, as, as you can imagine with nuclear reactions on the scales of billions of times more than any atomic bomb we've ever created, there would be a lot of violent, um, volatile throws of energy during this cooling down or uh, balancing process here. So up here we have, above we have, and this is kind of a wide one here, Jets are common exhaust products of star formation revealed when they ram into surrounding gas and dust. Here we have the central stars are hidden within the masses of infalling material, but typically the twin jets from a fledgling star span a region of about two light years across. And we can see here there's obscuring gas that don't let us see the actual source of the dust clouds here. But nonetheless, we can see the effects and they're big. Um, and then here, here we got gas streaming from the very young star LL Ori collides <laughs> sounds kind of like AA Ron LL Ori collides violently with a tenuous interstellar medium creating a bow shock around it so it's pretty amazing and what's pretty wild to think about is that 
as you can imagine, we've had a taste for the interstellar medium, the the medium in which, you know, all the stars kind of exist in our galaxy. And it's pretty violent. It's pretty um, energetic. It's pretty fast. And luckily our star, for all the violent things it, it throws out at us, it's kind of like a, like a really hard parent that's being a really disciplinarian parent that protects you from, you know, keeps a, keeps you fed, keeps your, you know, a shelter, uh, a roof over your head, and loves you, but still lays the hammer down when they need to. That's kind of our star. And, uh, you know, it's interesting that we, um, our planet, life wouldn't be able to exist because of the sheer enormity of stellar, of interstellar radiation, cosmic rays and energy that, you know, gamma rays and, and uh, other high energy, energy radiation out there that exists that our star with its billowing sol uh, solar winds constantly keeps at bay and the Voyager spacecraft actually recently just plowed right through there. And I think they they realized it was about twice as powerful of stellar interstellar winds as uh, they had previously thought. So over here we have... Oh, in the right here, okay. So these are uh, some more jets, you know, being propelled from uh, from new from the polar north and south. How do you um, ends of a star? I guess. And then here. Uh, here are the beautiful, beautiful, beautiful pillars of creation. And, God, these are so amazing to look at. They, uh, and there we go. So, serpents. The serpent is an oddity among constellations, and then it's split in two. Serpents caput, the serpent's head. In Serpent's Cauda, the Serpent's Tail. In between the, um, in between is the constellation of of Ophetius, the Serpent Bearer. So, Ophetius, the Serpent itself, is not an easy constellation to identify because it's, it has no particularly bright stars. One of its claims to fame, though, is just what it's not which is a uh, what it's not it's not considered by astrologers to be a constellation of the zodiac and it should be because the sun set spends longer passing through Ophetius than it does through Scorpius which is a zodiac constellation the omission of Ophetius as a star sign or zodiac constellation is uh, <laughs> oh, it's just a serious weakness they're saying for uh, astrology interesting but anyways the actual globular cluster itself M15 Messier 15 um, Serpents, Cauda. Oh, okay. So the actual globular cluster is M15, and then Serpents, Cauda, the tail, is M16, which is a bright nebula vaguely shaped like a bird without spread wings. Known as the Eagle Nebula, M16 was subject to one of the most dramatic images of the Hubble Space Telescope ever taken 
in 95. They called it the Pillars of Creation. And this shows dark columns of gas in which stars are being born. And the columns and or pillars are etched and silhouetted by light of the young, hot, massive stars beyond. So the pillars on the left are about one light year long. And uh, on the left. And the finger like, so the finger like protrusions at the top of the pillars are dense regions that probably contain newborn stars or at least proto stars. Termed EEGs, which are evaporating gaseous globules. They've been revealed because intense ultraviolet radiation from hidden massive stars has blown away less dense gas. And even the radiation will, it will blow away the gas in the EEGs as well, revealing the star inside for the first time. So, and then here, there's a close-up of this uh, this highest pillar right here, down here. So this here says. Uh, this is the close-up of the tallest pillar, and it shows globules. They're about as wide, each of them are about as wide as our solar system. That's so beautiful. That's awesome. And you can see the, um, the radial lines of gas kind of being emitted, being blown away. That's pretty amazing that... Um, you know, the stellar winds created by these newborn stars, they have so much force that they clear away all the dust and molecules and um, atoms from uh, from around them so that they kind of, it's almost like they're, they're claiming their territory to anthropomorphize it. And they're, you know, all the light elements, uh, hydrogen and helium and whatnot, are going to be blown away for the most part by their powerful ultraviolet radiation just streaming constantly from it now. Now that nuclear fusion has started. And um, what's left are the heavier elements that usually form planets. And that's why Earth, you know, for instance, is so... Um, you know, Mercury is so iron rich, Earth has so much gold on it, and, um, or not a lot, but it, it's also iron rich, and it prevents, you know, other stars, I guess, from forming too close to it. So it's an interesting law that, you know, going back to that feedback loop we were talking about. So. And up here, lastly, is the embedded cluster. Um, oh, okay, so this this view up here shows the entire nebula itself in all its glory there. And um, so it says the pillars are found near the center of the glowing cloud. Okay, so I guess they're right in there. And, oh, okay, I see, so this, that's the main pillar right there, very cool. The nebula, the nebula though, is uh, easily spotted through binoculars, it says. Alright guys, I... I'm going to close it up for today, for tonight. Hope you enjoyed looking through this pretty
pretty amazing book. It was, uh, it's fun. And the more I learn about it, the more, of course, I have a social instinct to want to communicate it with you and like everything, I always learn. Um, I hope it was yeah, somewhat enlightening. If not, I hope it was relaxing. And tune in for uh, our next episode. It's going to be a lot more detailed, a lot more um, structured, a lot more hopefully interesting. And it's going to be focused on the the science and the amazing, amazing uh, process of star formation and, and how it really itself is a constant feedback loop that keeps our galaxy and in turn our galaxy keeps it thriving and going and new stars being born all the time. So we're in an active universe amid other active uh, you know, galaxies and star systems and I guess really we're the only living planet but certainly there's a lot of uh, dynamical forces constantly at play in the universe for us still to learn and uh, better understand our place in the universe so thanks a lot for tuning in um, look forward to that new episode and we'll uh, we'll catch you next time joining me again guys it's incredible honor to be able to create this content and have all you guys give me such honest mostly positive and really encouraging feedback and I feel like owe you guys a slight apology if you've listened all the way to the end for having my uh, having recorded this late night into the evening and my voice was a little bit tense and perhaps it uh, sounded a little bit worse than it otherwise normally would so it's um, it's just really awesome to connect with you guys over topics I'm passionate about I hope you got a lot out of this and I hope you enjoy even more the uh, upcoming episodes of um, Star Birth, More Astronomy, Hokusai's Wave, and the history behind that. And um, many more. <laughs> many more on the, on the back burner. Have a great evening and sleep well. Bye.